Okay. This is an Ipswich River Watershed Association presentation on remembering river herring. Uh, where did they go and how do we get them back? I am Rachel Schneider, the Outreach Manager, and I will be moderating. Your presenters are Ryan O'Donnell, our Programs Coordinator, and Caitlin Shaw, our Science and Restoration Programs Manager. During our presentations, uh, participants will be on mute. If they have a question, please enter it into the chat box and presenters will take questions at the end. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Rachel. I'm Ryan O'Donnell and I'm going to begin the presentation by pr presenting some background on river herring, what kind of fish they are, and I'm going to talk a little bit about their life cycle. And that's important because it's, it's going to factor into the next part of the presentation where Caitlin will talk about um, uh, the, the things that are impacting that life cycle and disrupting it and um, causing problems for this, this fish in the Ipswich River. So we want to understand a little bit about what happened to them and what we're going to try to do to bring them back. Um, so I'll introduce um, river herring as in the group of fish that they belong to um, in the next slide. So, so river herring are, um, it's a collective term applied to several di different fish. There's the alewife, there's the uh, blueback herring, which is kind of similar to the alewife, and then there's the American shad. Um, the, the main difference here is with size. The alewife and blueback are about the same size. They look pretty similar otherwise. The American shad is much larger than either of the others. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about how each of them differs in terms of the life cycle. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about um, their migratory behavior. So these fish belong to a group of fish that are known as diadromous fish. So the next slide, I'll show you what that means. So diadromous fish means that they spend part of their life cycle in salt water and part of it in fresh water. So they switch between the two. There are two types of diadromous fish. There's one group that's called catadromous. A good example of that is the American eel. Uh, what that means is they um, spawn in salt water, so in the ocean, and then they'll spend their adult lives in fresh water. So they migrate um, as juveniles from salt water into fresh water where they'll complete their development into adults, spend time there, and at some point they'll return back out to the ocean to spawn themselves. Um, the group that herring belong to are what are known as anadromous fish. Uh, that mean, that's the exact opposite. So it means they spawn in fresh water and then they spend their adult lives at sea. Um, so they mature at sea for a period of time, return to freshwater habitats where they'll spawn and continue the life cycle. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in the upcoming slides. So, next. Uh, so there are many other types of um, migratory fish out there too, besides herring and eel. Um, other examples include rainbow smelt. You see that in the upper right hand corner. Um, they used to be common around here, mostly due to climate change. Their range has shifted northward. They prefer colder water. Um, again, the American eel in the upper left. Uh, the sea lamprey is another example of an anadromous fish like the alewife doesn't have an image here, but it's eel-like in appearance, except that it's a it's known as a jawless fish. So it has sort of a sucking, a sucker um, for its mouth essentially, where it has a 
series of rasping teeth and it clings to the side of larger fish and um, basically parasitizes them while they're um, adults out at sea. They're not parasitic when they're juveniles developing freshwater, they're just simple filter feeders and they're quite small. Both eel and lamprey are, are hard to find um, when they're in fresh water. They tend to hang out in the mud. Um, they're not very visible. So even though they're out there, you don't really see them that often. The Atlantic salmon used to be more common, um, kind of in New England and probably a little further south. Again, due to climate change, its range has kind of shifted more northward. So it's not really found that much in southern New England at all, maybe in parts of northern Maine, certainly into eastern Canada. And the Atlantic sturgeon, uh, it still um, is known to spawn in the Merrimack River. So it's still around, it's just far less abundant than it once was. But all these fish used to inhabit the Ipswich River. Smelt still do to some extent. They spawn below the dam usually in the spring. Um, but the others, well, the, the lampreys are still around, just not that many. No salmon, certainly, no sturgeon. And yes, um, this shad finds that sad. <laughs> so shad were also very common in the Ipswich River, but for certain reasons, they've also essentially disappeared. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slides. So this is what the overall life cycle of an anadromous fish looks like. Um, both alewife, blueback, herring, and shad all fit into this category. So we start in the ocean uh, where they develop um, at some point in their adult lives, they'll, they'll migrate to fresh water. Uh, they'll enter rivers, coastal rivers, find their way up streams. And when they get to a suitable spawning habitat, um, they'll, they'll spawn in the water. And um, once that's complete, the adults will return to the ocean. Um, they'll have a chance to um, spawn again, hopefully, if they survive. And meanwhile, the juveniles are left behind where they'll complete their development. And uh, once they're mature, they'll return to the ocean. So the migration begins in the spring. So this is the time of year, early to mid-April, when the herring run begins. And it continues through May, essentially. Um, and then the juvenile development takes place over the summer and the out migration of the juveniles takes place in the fall. Okay, next slide, I'll talk about some of the details of their life cycle in pieces. So um, again, so adult herring spend their lives in the ocean and it takes about three to five years for them to develop to the point where they'll uh, return to spawn. We don't know how they do it. Um, migration tends to be triggered by temperature. So when the water temperature reaches a certain point, uh, they'll, they'll somehow respond to that cue and know enough to um, migrate back upriver. And they usually will go back to their natal or birth waters. So where they were hatched and developed is where they'll ideally want to return to. Um, so the adults will then um, go back out to sea. And um, so we'll talk about the the spawning process in the next slide. Okay, so what we mean by spawning is that the males and females 
will release their reproductive materials directly into the water and where fertilization will take place. Um, and once that takes place, the fertilized eggs will settle onto a substrate. Um, alewife prefer to spawn in slow flowing, slow moving waters, typically lakes and ponds. The blueback herring, however, prefer to spawn in faster flowing water. So they can spawn directly in the river themselves. Um, so, and, and, and shad will also um, prefer to spawn in the river. So, um, shad are um, relatively weak swimmers. Um, these fish re rely typically on fish ladders to get into freshwater systems usually. So if they can reach suitable spawning habitat, their populations are okay. But if they can't, if it's disrupted by a fish ladder or something else, then, then that tends to break the cycle. In the case of the shad, they're much weaker swimmers than either of the um, AOIs or blueback. So, so that's why that they've essentially disappeared from the Ipswich River. Otherwise, there is good spawning habitat for them if they can be brought back. Um, so I'll play this short video clip here to show what this whole spawning kind of frenzy looks like and what it should look like under a healthy, in a healthy river. So you can see what's taking place. A bunch of fish are schooling in large numbers, all going in the same direction, headed for the same destination. Um, and this is really essentially all you really see. A bunch of fish moving, um, very active, very active swimmers. And um, that's what we should see. So next slide. So the uh, development process takes place over the summer. So the juveniles develop in fresh water wherever they've been uh, hatched. And um, they begin life as a fertilized egg. They'll develop into a larva and turn into a miniature adult called a, a fingerling. And then um, they themselves will probably respond to temperature changes when in the fall they'll migrate out to the ocean. Um, so I talked about their life cycle a bit and um, you can imagine that um, there are any, are any number of things that could go wrong with this. So even in a, a, a relatively undisturbed river, um, these fish are vulnerable to predation from birds, mammals, other fish, um, at any point along their migration path. And that whole process can be further disrupted um, when dams and other barriers are introduced that prevent them from accessing suitable spawning habitat. So we'll see in the next slide um, kind of what a healthy migration should look like. Again, large numbers of fish, um, all headed for the same destination. Um, we don't see this situation in the Ipswich River. We only have a small number of herring that return each year, only in a, a few hundred or so. Um, and so Caitlin is going to talk about um, what challenges these fish are facing and what we're trying to do to restore their, their, um, their run size population and kind of restart the herring migration. So turn it over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, so um, this is what's supposed to happen, but for the Ipswich River, you'll see that there's a number of uh, things that stand in the way of uh, the herring being able to um, reach the populations that they once um, had in the Ipswich River. Next slide, please. So actually several things, including dams here, this uh, image is showing um, dams in the Ipswich River watershed. And um, 
dams exist all along the main stem and uh, the tributaries of the Ipswich River. In addition, um, outdated culverts are also to blame for some of the issues with fish passage because fish need a certain openness of a culvert in order for them to feel comfortable going through it. And a lot of these outdated culverts are undersized and potentially are barriers for fish and other wildlife passage. Next slide, please. So this map is showing um, in the upper right hand corner, you see where the fish are. That's where the great marsh is. This is where the um, herring would come from the ocean and enter into the Ipswich River. You see the blue pathways are unimpeded um, access for those fish. But soon after entering Ipswich downtown, they have reduced uh, um, reduced access because of the Ipswich Mills Dam. And then as the fish continue up the system, they have severely reduced access due to additional dams. And then in the tributaries and upper Ipswich River, it's completely blocked because there is no fish passage past certain dams um, on the tributaries in the upper main stem of the river. Next slide, please. So the three dams that exist on the main stem of the Ipswich River, sometimes we call them run of river dams because these dams are not meant to hold back water or provide reservoirs for drinking water necessarily. They basically exist along the width of the natural um, river area. They might um, impound a little bit of water behind them but they exist mainly across the, um, the natural channel. Um, so the first dam that is encountered is in downtown Ipswich. It is the Ipswich Mills Dam. And you can see it driving through downtown Ipswich. It's owned by the town of Ipswich. The second dam is also in Ipswich. It's the Willowdale Dam. It's privately owned. And the third dam is the South Middleton Dam, which is also privately owned and exists um, as the last uh, main stem dam on the Ipswich River. Next slide, please. So the Ipswich Mills Dam and the Willowdale Dams, both in Ipswich, have fishways. Um, these fishways are basically meant for, as Ryan mentioned, um, stronger swimmers, such as the alewife and the blueback herring. Shad um, aren't capable of using the type of fishways that exist at Ipswich Mills and Willowdale dams. Um, so unfortunately, even if a fishway does exist, a lot of times they're meant for only a very small range of types of fish. Um, so obviously the best case scenario would be to not have dams um, to allow all the varieties of fish to get back up into the spawning habitat. Next slide, please. So basically, as um, the fish enter the Ipswich River, they soon come across the Ipswich Mills Dam. They might decide, oh, this obstruction isn't something that I can get by, or maybe they aren't able to. So um, they might lose the ability to return to their natal habitat. Um, if they do get through the fishway, it can be very tiring um, swimming up through a fishway and they could be exhausted and potentially not as quick to um, escape predation. In addition, going through a fishway is basically putting fish right um, in the view of birds and other um, predators. So um, as you'll see in this video here, this is from the Ipswich um, video camera that we pair with the um, herring count at the Ipswich Mills Dam. And you can see um, an otter is basically inside of the fishway, right where the camera is. And it's uh, taking herring out of, uh, out of the population, so. Smart guy here decided to target the fishway, um, and we got got him on camera. So, 
this has implications down the line, not just for the adult populations that can't get up to where they need to spawn, but also it has implications for the amount of juveniles that are going to imprint on those ponds and areas that um, they were born in, which basically has the eventual effect of just limiting the number of fish that are returning to the Ipswich River because of these um, barriers. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, that's not great for herring, and it's definitely not good for the types of herring that don't use fishways, but it's also not very good for a number of other um, predatory uh, species that um, predate forage fish like river herring. Basically, some things that you might um, be interested in if you're a recreational fisher would be um, striped bass or tuna, um, which, uh, enjoy eating herring. Um, so you might uh, be limited in terms of um, eventually the ability to uh, uh, find the animals that um, are feeding on um, forage fish like river herring. So it, it kind of has a cascade up the, up the line in terms of um, the food web goes. Next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> in the past, the Ipswich River once had annual runs of um, herring in the millions, according to uh, historic reports. Um, back then, they measured herring in barrels, so it's kind of funny to read the old reports and see um, how many barrels of herring were being taken out of the Ipswich River. Um, because herring were so important, um, they were and they still are celebrated that when they return to rivers, especially rivers that have had restoration take place, like in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, they removed a couple of barriers and have a, a populations that return and the community has, um, you know, increased tourism based on the return of the fish there. And the similar situation occurs on Cape Cod when the fish return, the migratory fish return back. So these days, um, our fish camera at the Ipswich Mills Dam and our dedicated herring count volunteers see the numbers of run sizes down in the 400 range. Um, this is because of that cascading effect of not being able to get as many adults up into the system, which means that less juveniles are imprinting on the Ipswich River and less juveniles are returning back. Um, so that cascading effect um, has had an impact on the Ipswich River. However, a number, numerous, numerous, um, instances have shown that, you know, if you can remove those barriers and um, start stocking the ponds and the river again, that you are able to um, have really successful restoration um, eventually. So there's still hope. Um, next slide, please. This is an example of a restoration project, so it's a short video. Um, Alewife and blueback uh, herring are species of river herring that migrate through the tributaries of the Barnegat Bay. When the water is warmer in the springtime, these fish species swim upstream to spawn. River herring are sought by recreational fishers as bait for larger game fish and are also caught as bycatch in commercial fishing. Overfishing coupled with habitat loss have caused a decline in river herring. Westercon Creek is located within the Barnegat Bay watershed and provides habitat for many migratory and year-round aquatic species. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife removed an old dam that was hindering fish passage through the creek. Removing the dam has restored the stream's connectivity and spawning habitats that are critical for migrating fish species. Now, aquatic organisms can pass freely through the creek. 
In support of these habitat restoration efforts, the Barnegat Bay Partnership has monitored the creek's fish distribution and abundance for three years. One year when the dam was still in place and for two years after its removal. During the springtime, research staff at the Barnegat Bay Partnership deployed two fikes on either side of the former dam location, one downstream and one upstream. The migrating river herring will first be caught in the downstream fike, then make their way towards the upstream fike. At both fike locations, water temperature, dissolved oxygen levels, stream flow and depth are also taken at each site. It's 0.13. And 1.4. The depth here was 1.9 feet yep. and the flow was 0 0.10 meters per second. Yes. What we have here is a blueback herring. So when we catch one of our river herring that we're looking for in our nets, we first weigh them and then we measure them. 211 and 223. And then we take a fin clipping as well as scales. After all of our equipment is used, it all gets sterilized in alcohol so that there's no um, bacteria uh, put between fish. Taking down the pike. So as you can see, um, the removal of uh, dams and barriers can have um, a really positive effect on the return of river herring. Next slide. So in the Ipswich River watershed, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the three main stem dams. The Ipswich Mills Dam, owned by the town of Ipswich, uh, had a complete feasibility study completed in 2018 and it looked at all components of the removal of the Ipswich Mills Dam and how that would affect um, nearby properties and resources and infrastructure. Um, the findings basically um, concluded that one additional investigation would have to be completed in order to design appropriate mitigation in the um, in the event that one small portion of a nearby building has um, contained soft soils. Um, it is unlikely, but the research uh, needs to be done in order to determine that um, and access to the building is required. So the town of Ipswich with um, us and uh, additional project partners as part of the technical advisory committee are currently looking for funding opportunities um, to fund that additional investigation um, in the nearby building and working with the owner of that building to do so. So that project is moving along and we recently completed a um, outreach video um, describing the project and we're gonna have a, an event soon to um, release that video and have a Q&A session. So look, look out for that. Um, the next dam encountered is the Willowdale Dam. As I mentioned, it's privately owned and it is not um, going to be up for removal. The owners are not interested in removing the dam, but there is a fishway currently there and a new fishway, an Alaskan steep pass fishway will be um, installed at that site um, very soon. The last dam along the Ipswich River uh, main stem is the South Middleton Dam. It's also privately owned um, by a, a local company and um, they are actively working on um, the permitting phase of removing that dam that does not have a fishway associated with it. Um, the removal of the South Middleton Dam, in addition to the improved fishway at Willowdale and continued access through Ipswich Mills, will improve um, 57 miles of uh, river and tributary habitat, which would be a really significant restoration project once that dam comes out. Next slide, please. So in addition to the main stem dam removals and work um, on fishways that we are part of, we also recently received a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, grant 
aimed at restoring uh, the Howlett Brook watershed for herring habitat. So this project has numerous uh, components, um, one of which is that Trout Unlimited National will be working with the towns of Ipswich, Topsfield, and Boxford to develop um, design, engineering design plans for some of the undersized culverts in these areas, and also coming up with cost estimates for the towns as a logical next step for them to apply for further funding to improve those barriers. Um, in addition, uh, there's been work done on Hood Pond to investigate whether Hood Pond is suitable herring habitat. And um, it was found that it is suitable herring habitat. So another component of this project is to spend money um, that was received through this grant uh, towards the town of Topsfield, Topsfield to improve the Pond Street um, culvert at Hood Pond. Um, in addition, uh, this area is considered one of the last um, remaining cold water designated habitats and uh, Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition is working to uh, monitor temperature in the area and also look for um, the presence of brook trout through eDNA sampling. Next slide, please. In addition to um, improving habitat conditions for migratory fish and also animals that may have to come up and over a roadway in order to get um, up their um, river or tributary corridors. Um, there's additional benefits to flooding, which is why the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Action Grant Program funded additional engineering design plans to advance work in the Hallett Brook watershed. So um, bigger culverts mean less road flooding, and it means that migratory fish and animals like deer and beaver are not going to be um, end up as roadkill as they go up and over um, a road because they can't go through the culvert that's undersized. So um, making these structures uh, bigger and uh, meet the road, uh, the Massachusetts uh, stream crossing standards it, um, is trying to limit um, both the impassability of migratory fish and also um, the impassability of uh, terrestrial wildlife as well. In addition, um, recreational access um, will Im be improved. Um, bigger crossings mean that, you know, we as humans can fit under them and um, traverse them in, you know, boats and kayaks. Um, Getting rid of the dams means that we would have access basically to the estuary, um, you know, on, on uh, watercraft. Uh, in addition, um, it, there can be uh, wide ranging economic benefits um, associated with restoration. Um, anything from tourism to recreation to um, the impact on predatory species in the nearby estuary and ocean. Um, so there's a, a number of benefits of um, restoration projects. Next slide, please. So hopefully, as you've learned um, from this presentation, uh, the Ipswich River needs your help. And when we um, disrupted the flow between saltwater and freshwater, river and tributary, and stream and pond. We also lost some of our connection to the environment and to nature. So we'd like to work to bring back that connection and bring back the herring and so that we can celebrate their return. Next slide, please. So we have a number of other events that are coming up as part of this um, as part of this Ocean of Rivers um, a series of events. Um, if you want to learn more about restoration and resiliency work.
the Ipswich River Watershed is working on, you can go to ipswichriver.org slash restoration dash resiliency. You can also learn about our herring count and sign up to volunteer um, on our website. You can um, donate to the Ipswich River Watershed to support our programs, and you can look at calendar events as well. Um, in addition, you can follow us on Facebook to know about what we're doing on a more on a more timely basis. Um, and we'd like to cover a couple of questions that came up during the presentation. Um, Rachel, would you like to go over the questions? Yeah, great. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, some people asked about beaver dams and whether they're an impediment to fish passage. So beaver dams are very prevalent in the Ipswich River watershed and um, some people definitely believe that they're more prevalent now than they have been in the past when potentially trapping or other um, conditions were not suitable for them. Um, however, beaver dams, as long as there's enough water um, in the river and we do a good job of conserving water, the water can flow over the beaver dams, allowing the fish to um, get past them much easier than they are able to get past um, a hard structure like a dam um, because it's a natural structure and the water is meant to flow over the sides of the dam. So there, um, there should be the ability with enough water for fish to get through um, the, the beaver dams. However, we do know of a number of um, efforts to kind of control the populations because obviously if you think about um, the progression of just the environment in our area, a lot of the predators of beavers aren't around anymore. So that's another reason why they're so prevalent is because there's nothing really controlling their populations. Um, so there are people that try to do that and you know it's a little contentious but um, as we know our, our balance has kind of gone off as we've developed areas that used to have more natural um, predator prey relationships. Yeah, and I'll just uh, add to that to put into perspective the beaver populations coming back. Uh, we have reports um, from about the mid 90s for the town of Middleton and the and the Boxford, Topsfield, Middleton, Tritown, um, which at that time said that there were no beavers currently living in the town of Middleton. Uh, if you've paddled the Ipswich River in Middleton, or if you've just explored uh, waterways along the town, you know that's certainly not true anymore. There are tons of beavers. Uh, beavers do build their dams deliberately leaky um, as a water control method and to, to allow the dams to retain their strength even when there are surges in water levels. Um, and they have a couple different dam designs depending on where they're building their dams. So they really more rely on um, successions of dams, sort of stepped dams to help keep water in the areas, to keep their lodge entrances below water, um, and rather than human dams, which will be just a very solid, large structure um, to keep that water back. Uh, and there are certainly, there's downsides and benefits to the beavers being around. Um, like Caitlin said, with good healthy water levels, if we're all conserving water, the beaver dam should not be an impediment to um, fish making their way into tributaries um, or up the river. Uh, and they're also providing other habitat for other species. Um, the beaver dams are uh, very good breeding grounds for insects. Uh, which benefits a variety of different species. And uh, beavers, when they create their beaver meadows, not only create a, a habitat for a great number of birds, um, but specifically they create the dead trees, uh, I believe white pines, that uh, great blue herons prefer to nest in. And the great blue heron nests are the favorite uh, breeding grounds for great horned owls who will hang out in those nests uh, actually, about this time of year, we're in early April now, you can go out and see the Huron rookeries, uh, where the Hurons are currently building and repairing their nests, and you might see a, uh, an owl 
sitting in a nest, maybe with its fledglings already out, or maybe still waiting for them to hatch. So you have uh, be definite benefits to the beavers being around and hopefully not impeding the fish, but humans are here as well. So when we do get those low water levels, beaver dams can be an impediment. Uh, and of course, beavers, when there's lots of water, can sometimes cause problems with humans because uh, sometimes we build in areas that the beavers also want to build in and that can create conflicts such as um, flooding. Uh, and still on beavers, someone asked, what about beaver deceivers? Uh, can fish pass through those? So, Technically, beaver deceivers should be um, traversable. However, what typically happens with beaver deceivers is that they get clogged up um, with debris. And if they're not cleaned out, then they basically start to act like a dam. So beaver deceivers really need to be regularly maintained in order to um, allow for that passage. Obviously, it's not ideal, but um, we are trying, you know, all of the towns are trying to balance a number of um, competing interests, like keeping the culverts from flooding and getting clogged by beaver activity while trying to um, maintain the, like a free passage through the beaver deceiver system. And so we have another question. Um, what about the physiological changes that fish undergo um, to pass from freshwater to saltwater or vice versa? Yeah, so um, that's a good point. Um, it's obviously much more beneficial for fish to have a gradual transition physiologically between fresh and salt water. Um, it can be a shock to their system to go directly from pure ocean water to pure fresh water without that transition, which is what occurs when a dam is um, put in the middle of a river. Basically, below the Ipswich Mills Dam is estuarine conditions, and above the Ipswich Mills Dam is riverine conditions. And um, that can be shocking to um, species that are meant to have that gradual transition between those two salinities. In addition, um, like on the same vein of physio physiology and um, like, um, you know, chemical issues surrounding fish migration, um, there was another um, comment that came in about how, um, how do herring play a role in nutrient dynamics? Um, actually, herring are really beneficial um, for water quality in the sense that the adults are out in the ocean and then coming back and the juveniles do a lot of their, um, you know, eating and growing in um, the the ponds, especially the alewife that um, live in the ponds, they basically are taking up that biomass, that algae and plant matter, and then they're exporting it at, back out to the ocean. So they do tend to um, be an export um, transition, like an export of nutrients from the ponds that they um, are born in to the ocean, um, which can be beneficial for water quality. Right. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh, if anyone watching this recording that we're making a presentation has additional questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Uh, either on Facebook or on YouTube, we'll be posting this in both places or on our website or feel free to send a message to us. Uh, you can send it to info at ipswichriver.org. And thank you so much for watching Remembering River Herring. Yep, thanks for watching our video and let us know if you have any questions. Thanks everyone.